Hi, guys. I'm a big fan. Hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. How you doing? Doing, doing just ducky. <laughs> and Marietta's here. Okay. Alice, how's your knee? My knee is just much better. Much better. Two, uh, three weeks ago today, I had surgery. Three. Good. Three. <laughs> um, and uh, luckily, I got the PA on the follow up visit because he, he, I mean, I had to beg for physical therapy. I've never heard of such a thing, but I did. And I got PT, and uh, life is good with PT. <laughs> yeah, it good. really is. It's much better. You know, I work on a concrete floor, so I've just got to be very careful. Mm -hmm. But other than that, thank you for asking. Amy, are you going to stay muted and stay uh, blacked out? I won't do the dishes. You don't have no, to. No, just while I'm cleaning up my table. Oh. <laughs> I understand. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm better with listening anyway. That's okay. That does a lot more than I do. <laughs> well, we're gonna we have a chat that's gonna open up. So, oh great, that's the easy way to ask questions if you don't want to talk. If you want to just eat your dinner while you're talking to us, which is Thank you. you know Zoom does all kinds of amazing. Things. My friend Denise yeah. Denise Howe uh, teaches over at Immaculate High School, and she was teaching a class in the middle of the day, and one of the kids started to just laugh hysterically, and she said, "You know what's up?" And he said, oh, "I'm watching a really great video." It was terrible. I mean, that was Hi, just... Donna. Hi, Donna. Hi, Catherine. I was going to go without video, and then I saw there are only eight people here. I'm like, okay. Yeah, you <laughs> I'm here to week. report you, but I have my big thick glasses that. on. Donna and Amy and I all teach, um, and, and so we're used to also students who don't want to put their videos on. <laughs> nice to see you. I'm so really happy to, to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> But it's okay if you feel the need to like take off the camera. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mark you down. <laughs> Donna, how did you get on with? Did you sign up through my uh, portal? Yes, and I didn't realize it was a sign in advance, and I only did that three minutes ago. So I was about to oh, text our probably, colleague yeah. to say, do you "Here you are. Got it. But here I am. You can do yes. that. Go ahead and yeah. share it. Do whatever." Yeah. Um, we're only waiting for three. We've got Kate and Anita and Nathan coming. And David's decided to stay anonymous down there. Um, <laughs> for those of you who live in the dark ages and haven't been on Zoom like all day, every day anyway, um, chat has a little icon at the bottom of the page. And you can click that and open up a window to the right. And that's where I have put the link to the book if you've not seen it or, or heard about it, uh, which is entirely possible. And for a personalized signed book plate, email me at alice at birdsbooks.com and I also put that in the chat. Um, we are recording it tonight just so that I can send it out as a thank you to each of you and also to send it out to anyone who might have missed it that registered tonight. Uh, we only had about a dozen books, a dozen people sign up tonight, and I know why. Alice was stupid and didn't use the calendar that had the holidays listed on them, and tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. So I have a huge apology going out to most of my friends, who, who many of my friends who are celebrating tonight and said, I can't come. And I said, well, I'm going to send you the recording. So... Apologies to you and to Catherine, who is going to celebrate later with family or, or tomorrow. Or, and for those of you celebrating Christmas or Festivus or whatever, um, I promise not to schedule an author event on Christmas Day. So, Alice, I all. thought this was your Hanukkah present to us. It is, your, it is my Hanukkah present to you. So, yeah, my house sounds like lots right now because I cook them early so we can eat them later. Yeah. Hi, Anita. Hi, Anita. Steve. Hi, How Steve. are you? Hi. Um, for those of you who have not been on a Zoom call with me formally, uh, thank you again for coming tonight. And uh, thank you to Catherine Prince for being here tonight. I'm really excited to, see, to hear and see about this book. 
how I found out about this book was Catherine came in to talk about her newer book, Queen of the Mountaineers, The Trailblazing Life of Fanny Bullock Workman. Uh, and I will put that book in the chat as well. But because our book groups have always committed themselves to having paperback available for affordability purposes, I asked her, what, what else you got? And this is the book that came up. And it you know, in looking at all the reviews of the book, one of the things that surprised me is how often it was to, it was compared to Titanic. In that it was a major, major nautical event, but more people even died in this one than did the Titanic, and it was purposeful. Um, it wasn't an accident. It was so. I really, I really enjoyed a lot about this book, um, and I watched what other people said about it, and I was impressed with um, the reception that it got. And so I thought it was a great book for our history book group. So um, we then opened it up to everybody else, and Donna is here, and Amy's here, and maybe David knows you also, or Virginia, or you know, your friends, but I'm really excited that you came and I'm really looking forward to hearing about how you got your book published. Um, you're, anyone is welcome to unmute themselves and to ask a question as we go on. Amy's got um, a presentation, I, you know, slides, pictures that we're gonna be sharing this evening. So um, I think what I'd like to do is start with a question is, how did you get this particular book published? Um, oh, you're just, blind. excuse me. Hey, hold yeah. the horses. I'm going to read you a little thing. Catherine Prince, oh. the author of A Professor, a President, and a Meteor in the Birth of American Science, for which she won the Connecticut Press Club's 2011 Book Award for Nonfiction. She's also the author of Burn the Town and Sacks the Banks and Sack the Banks, Confederates Attack Vermont, and Shot from the Sky American POWs in Switzerland. She worked as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor in Switzerland and in New York, where she covered the United Nations. It says Prince covers the Connecticut State House for Patch. Do you still do that? Oh, no, I stopped that around 20. Because that's the bio that was attached to this book, but the bio that's uh, attached to your more recent book says you're yeah. the author of American Daredevil, Death in the Baltic, Shot from the Sky. She has worked with a cor as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor in Switzerland and New York, where she reported on the United Nations and is a frequent contributor to the Times of Israel. So that's another part of, of who you are. But um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear how you got published and then how you found your content. And as Nancy asked, what drew you to this story? Sure. So um, I think both those questions uh, can be answered together. The, the first, um, I think the first part is what drew me to the story. That, that starts before I get published. And what drew me to the story was I was talking with my dad and he mentioned that he had read this really small little blurb about the Wilhelm Goose Club and that it was more people died in it in any maritime disaster than in peace or war. So I was curious, I'm a really curious person, and I started to look it up. This was probably 2011. So there was some information, but not like, it still, I don't think compares to today being able to access on the internet. So I, I found a few little blurbs, but um, I did find the name of a documentarian in Canada. So I, who had done a little piece on it. So I emailed him and I was just a little bit curious, you know, what is this, what is this shift? So he wrote back and that's what got me started thinking about this um, ship that was filled with East Prussian refugees, so civilians um, in the closing days of World War II. So uh, you have, it's like January, 1945 and the, um, East, this is all on the Eastern Front. So the Red Army is coming into East Prussia and you have all these um, pretty much mothers and children left and, and older people. Everybody else has been conscripted 
by Hitler to, to fight the rest of the war. So that, I was interested about that. This was a little, um, I think, so not, I know I'm trying to search for the right word, I guess not really known so much what was going on in the Eastern Front in terms of what we were studying in history when I was growing up. So much of the war was the Western Front um, and, so, and then later the Pacific Sea there. So this idea of civilians being caught up in something like this um, and what happened to them that I didn't know about, I thought, okay, I wanna know a little bit more. So I, before I even worked on a book proposal, which is the whole thing, about, which is about getting published, I contacted this one man named Horst Voigt, who has since passed away. And he's, um, his story is featured in the book. So I called him and told him a little bit about my background that I had previously published a couple of books and I just, you know, can, you know, really just wanted to hear his story. So this is one of these things that um, my journalism background, I think of just that cold call. Um, I just want, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. Tell me a little bit more about your story. So um, after I contacted Horace um, and we corresponded a little bit, he then said, uh, I don't know if he proposed it or I proposed it that I was going to go up and visit for a couple of days and really just spend like two or three days like you know, intensively interviewing him. And so I went up um, with my mom. So she came with me. She's sort of like my roadie. And we got up to his house and I spent like two or three days with him. And after that, he was 10 years old at the time of the thinking um, or the torpedo. I knew like this was a story. I really had a sense there now. This was something that we just weren't really aware of unless I think if you're deep into Eastern Front history, um, maritime history, then you would have heard about it. But generally we just, you know, for about 70 years, more than 70 years now, that story was relatively hidden. So I, I felt like this was a really good way to look at this incident that was a lens through which to look at like a wider concept of why we don't know so much about what happened to those civilians that were part of the Third Reich who, um, you know, who were not Jewish primarily. So, and, and for me, that was really interesting because I am Jewish. So my whole view of this part of the war, you know, is very much tied up with, with what happened during the Holocaust. So I wanted to kind of put myself in a bit of an uncomfortable situation of trying to understand um, what it was like to, to, to grow up in Germany at that time as a civilian and then with your lives being threatened to become a refugee and have to flee. So to get it published, um, you know, you just procedurally was, you know, write that overview. This is what my story is going to be about and, you know, pitching it to a few different publishers, developing the chapter synopsis and then of course at the end a chapter you know a sample chapter which for that I focused on the thinking itself like the you know, attack itself um, but that's those are you know what drew me to the story that these were just you know these were more than you know numbers and all the statistics of how many people died in World War II these were names that I could attach to it you know and I follow in the book um, about six or seven survivors um, and so, you know, how they came to be on that boat was something that really compelled me, you know. And then what happened to them after? You know, the thinking is one piece of it, but then how did they live after that? And why was this story suppressed versus another? How much traveling uh, did you have to do in your research? For, for this book, I did quite a bit. I went to um, Switzerland to interview a survivor. I went to the National Archives and uh, spent a couple trips down there and also the um, Holocaust Memorial Museum for their oral history. So that was a separate trip to Las Vegas I got to go, but I spent the whole time in Las Vegas interviewing a survivor, um, did not did not actually, you know, tour the casinos or anything. Um, and then also up to um, Canada again for these uh, sisters who were survivors. Some of the um, interviews then were done 
on the phone. So no one was doing Zoom or <laughs> back then. So it was like 2012. So some of the interviews were done by phone. And um, and then after I, any of the in-person ones, you know, following up with correspondence. How hard was it to find original sources if you had to? I mean, I'm sure a lot of this wasn't even scanned in yet, or was it? Uh, not scanned in. So original sources, the hardest part was getting the information and the records from the German archives. So, so many of the archives originally that I wanted had been destroyed, not, not, not the original ones, but like the building had been destroyed and they had been moved you know, so I had to kind of track them down. But then because so many of them are in German, so that's another issue. I, I am not a German speaker. So I got in touch at the um, Federal Archives in Germany. There was a research researcher there, a librarian there, who was really kind enough to assist me. And I basically said, I want everything. Like, I don't, if it turns out that it won't be useful, that's fine. So they photocopied boxes of things for me, sent them here, mm -hmm. but I'm fortunate that my husband does speak German. So um, so he availed himself and we spent many, many nights where he translated documents for me. So letters, documents, journals on that end. I wondered he, about that because how you got it from the German to English without it being digitized. Yeah. Because, because so that, I'm not a German speaker either. And I, I mean, I can read passable French, but I still would need it translated for me. I mean, something yeah, like so, that. Yeah, so I was fortunate for that. <laughs> that was just a lucky, that was lucky. Um, and then for documents in the United States, that was easy enough. You know, it was just a matter of digging and combing through. Um, the survivors was really interesting tracking down people because I had a few of them who were really hesitant to bring, you know, to revisit this uh, part of their life. I mean, as you, as you can imagine, it's incredibly, it was incredibly traumatic. And about three or four of them just did not want to talk. About, after that interview, if that was going to be the last interview. The, uh, the woman in Switzerland, for example, she had her daughter with her while I interviewed her. And she could speak fluent English. As the story got more and more painful though, she would start to revert to German. And so her so her daughter was there to help along for those uh, moments. Oh, that must have been difficult for yeah. you too. I mean, just to interview someone who's going through such changes when you really just needed what it was like. But, um, I understand you have some pictures to show us. I do. So I have slides. I have photos that um, you always have to, you know, call your photos for a book. So I have a lot of photos that didn't make it into the book that I thought I could share. And that will give me a chance to tell you a little bit more about the book. Oh, well, that's so great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, those are all my emails. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need to see. All right. Okay. So, so I just um, to talk a little bit about the ship itself. So this is the goose block that was launched from the Blom and Boss shipyard in 1937 on May 5th. Um, it was just a day before. I was just thought, I would like to think about sort of the split screen of, of history in a sense because it's, the day before this, um, the Hindenburg had crashed and burned in Lakehurst. Oh my God. And so I just, you know, timing wise. So the Goose Lock was um, a 25,484 ton ship. It was 684 feet long. And it was the pride and joy of the Germany's KGF or Strength Through Joy fleet. So just by way of comparison, uh, you mentioned the Titanic. The Titanic was 46,000 tons and 882 feet long. Um, another little comparison then is so when the Hindenburg caught fire, uh, there were 97 people aboard the ship and 36 died. When the S-13, a Soviet submarine, torpedoed the Goose Bluff, we had more than 9,000 died. Both ships 
were launched with great fanfare, but they both strike a really different chord in our memory. The airship doesn't carry the weight of Nazi Germany the same way the goose bluff does. So it's a little hard to make out, but at the bottom, what looks kind of just like shrubbery down there is actually just hordes of people. There was masses of crowds there to see it off because the boat was built to symbolize the strength and power of the Third Reich. It was named for William uh, Guslov, who was the assassinated leader of Switzerland's Nazi party. So this was a menu for the maiden voyage. And um, you know, it was really a, a way they felt like to bring luxury to the masses. This is the Germans started the KDS program in the mid 1930s. And it was a large scale social program. So the idea was to deliver recreation to the people. And it was part of the German labor front, which was established in 1933 after the Reichstag abolished trade unions. So everybody aboard was a member, but you were not, that was not a, that was a mandated membership. You weren't voluntarily joining the KDF program. You actually, you know, you were forced to join and pay dues. And in return, you got sporting events, operas, harvest festivals, um, these cruise liners. And until this program, most German citizens never traveled outside of their country. So in 1938, it burst in um, Nigeria, it sailed to Africa, it sailed to Scandinavia. And the idea was there was no first or third class. And the, the idea was one people, one empire, one leader. And the Guslov just was another propaganda tool for Nazi Germany. Oh. So here's a, a photo of officers eating aboard. So the, the Guslov had many um, iterations that went from the cruise liner that you saw, and then it became a hospital ship in September 1939. And it was a floating dormitory. So at that point, it docked and it stayed in drive, it stayed docked for the next uh, several years and it tended to the sick and wounded. They painted a wide green band around the hull and red cross symbols on the deck and the stack. And then in 1940, it was designated an accommodation ship for U-boat trainees. So those are the officers here. So as I mentioned, I, I was able to interview several survivors. And um, this is the Reuter Furniture Store in Konigsberg, East Prussia. This is now Poland. So Another one of these split screens is that just three weeks after the Hollywood Grumman's Chinese Theater premiered The Wizard of Oz, Poland was invaded, September 1st, 1939. So September 10th, German ground forces march in from the west and the Russians from the east. But in East Prussia, where most of the refugees from the Goose Bluff came from, they were somewhat isolated from the war. All of the Nuremberg laws, all of the Nazi policies that we know of were, didn't come into effect in East Prussia until a, a little bit later. Um, but once that happened and the Nazis took over, they requisitioned whatever they wanted. So the Reuter factory here was no, um, no exception. And inside they used slave and prison labor. The Nazi regime forbade anyone to leave until the last week of January 1945. So anyone there as, you know, East Prussia starts to get squeezed by the Russians on one side and the Germans on the other, and people were desperate to flee, they're not allowed to, not until January 45. And by not allowed, I mean, they would have been executed if they tried to leave, if they would have been seen as traitors. So Helga Reuter Knickerbocker, she's the one from Las Vegas. This was, uh, that was her family's furniture shop. And she remembered seeing people who might have been from the Stutthof concentration camp, which was nearby, working in that, um, you know, in, in the factory at that point. But this is a picture prior to the war. And she and her older sister Inga, who are pictured here during one of their 
summer vacations on the Baltic Sea, and they look forward to this every year. And Helga, when I was interviewing her, talked about that they had been at the beach when um, the Germans came in, and they made a mad dash, you know, they will as, one, as fast as one could back to their home in Konigsberg. This is a picture of the girls and their mother. Um, unfortunately, Inga did not survive. Um, so Helga survived the sinking and uh, Inga did not. Um, at, oh, there we go. So that's another model of the ship. So the way it's painted now is how it looks more when it was uh, requisitioned for the U-boat trainees, all gray. Um, and the, the Guzla could comfortably transport about 1,500 passengers at the time. There were 22 lifeboats and 12 transverse bulkheads. So that made up, so the bulkheads made for 13 watertight compartments. Each lifeboat was supposed to hold 70 people. On the day that it sank, there were upwards of 10,000 people on this ship. So you had, there were eight decks and most of the refugees were um, trapped below the promenade deck, which was glass enclosed. And it's hard to see here, but where you can see those two stripes, they look sort of gray and green. So below that is where most of the refugees were. And that just became a trap for them. And so most of them died inside the ship. Um, so this is Helga today. Um, she's holding her identity card, which is a little tough to see. But like the other survivors, Helga actually made it into a lifeboat. Um, and the boats in the area that heard her distress call picked them up. Her sister just didn't make it. Her sister just kind of, she saw her sister, you know, in the water, um, but wasn't able to pull her into the lifeboat. And the reason Helga has those photos is that she wore her father's trousers to go when, when he told the two of them, you know, it's time for you to get out of uh, Konigsberg. So she was wearing her father's trousers and for some reason decided to put some photographs in the back pocket, which is just amazing that they survived her plunge into the water. Um, after the rescue operation, Helga and the other survivors were taken to the island of Rügen in the Baltic Sea, where the German Red Cross processed people and then essentially sent them on their way. A, a crazy fate that is one of those, um, you know, you can't make this stuff up, is, is that Helga then survived the Dresden firebombing. So uh, she, she's a tough, a tough lady. This is just a oh, picture a of what- woman, that's awful. Yeah, like unbelievable. Uh, uh, unbelievable. And 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 when she first told me that, that was one of those uh, tough but verify moments because she told me that, and I thought that's just you know no way, like that that happened. But then it, you know was able to find out you know which train she was on and then where the fire bombings occurred, and she she was she was on a train during that fire bombing. Um, so the boarding pass, some of the refugees had these boarding passes. Initially, they had official documentation to get on board. Once Hitler said, fine, you know, you, you know, these people can be play Konigsberg, um, East Prussia. But the majority didn't at the at the the last hours of boarding were just mayhem where people were just um, you know, pushing their way onto the boat. So that's why the numbers are a little hard to tell because, you know, we don't know if it was more because of the, the ship's manifest only had the name of those who were, you know, had these kinds of boarding passes. So another um, group of survivors um, originally came from Riga, Latvia. This is a photo of the Chinkor Bakery. So the pair of sisters that I was able to interview were Irene Chinkor East and her sister, Ellen Chinkor Maybe. And they were deported with their parents um, from Latvia in 1939 because of the molotov ribbentrop Pact. So the, the two sisters were, were born in Latvia. They had no, I, you know, no sense of anything that was German, but 
because they had ancestors who once came from Germany, um, they were moved to German lands. Um, that was reclaimed by the Nazis as part of the pact. You know, those, those early displacements and population forced swaps that were going on. And so the two sisters always considered themselves Latvians. And when they got to East Prussia, they just had no clue <laughs> what life was going to be about. These are the sisters from a few years ago. Um, they, they settled in Canada after the war. But the sisters told me that after the war, um, they learned that their uncle and cousin were spent uh, three years in the forced labor camp. So after the war ended, depending on where you were, which side um, in Germany, you know, which side of the Iron Curtain, the traumas didn't end. You know, you had people like these two sisters who had uncles and cousins who were sent off to Soviet forced labor camps. In the war's aftermath, though, the two sisters um, found and read and reread their father's pastry cookbook to just try to state their appetite. And they uh, took that book with them when they came to Canada. Uh, they came in 1948. Their parents survived the war as well. Um, they came to treasure this cookbook of recipes with them. And then um, here is Inga Bendrick Rodecker. She's a little baby, a little blurry baby in this photo, but she's one of the youngest survivors, um, pictured with her grandmother Rosalie, and the, and then um, Inga's mom Milda. Inga lives in Australia now, and she spoke with her mom almost every day about this thinking. She obviously did not recall the torpedo attack. Um, Inga was kind enough to share with me her mother's letters to her and her mother's journal entries about the thinking. Um, but one of Nilda's greatest hurts, so Inga's mom, was that people laughed at the this idea that they survived the world's worst maritime disaster. You know, most people didn't believe it, or most people didn't also didn't care if you, you know, grew up in the West because there was definitely this attitude of these East Prussian or these German refugees, you know, had it coming because of their government. And then lastly, um, this is Horst White. He was a baby with his grandparents in um, East Prussia. So he's a little bit of a hero in this story. He was 10 years old, he and his mother. Uh, got aboard the ship and he, at the last moment before they fled, took a jackknife he had, um, thrust it into his pockets. They make their way to the ship. They get aboard the ship. Um, it was one of the coldest nights in the year when the goose bus was sailing across the Baltic and many of the lines on the lifeboat froze. And he was in his lifeboat and, the, and a lot of these lifeboats started to just snap and fall into the water. And they were able to use his jackknife that he stole from his uncle to cut the line and free it so it could lower down. Uh, this is Captain Alexander Marinesco. He's the submarine captain who was responsible for fi firing the three torpedoes into the ship. And the Soviets definitely knew that this was a boat carrying predominantly civilian refugees um, because they could see they were straight, the Soviet Air Force was tracing the masses of refugees fleeing towards the, the coast um, on their way to the port to you know get on, on the ship. So, and the ship was marked with hospital markings, but uh, Marinesco was hopeful, you know, was hoping to um, restore his career. This is one of the four captains aboard the Gustloff. Um, there was a lot of bickering that night about how best to cross the Baltic Sea, whether to go straight, whether to zigzag. Um, Zahn wanted to travel faster than the other captain, Peterson. So there's a lot of argument over how to avoid subs or the landmines. It was a little damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, the final images I'll, I'll close with are from diving in the wreck. So few people have ever dove the wreck of the Wilhelm Goose Club. Uh, Mike Boring was a diver who I was, uh, who I interviewed and who shared his photos with me. He got permits from the Polish government 
and today the goose left rests in about 150 feet of water in the Baltic Sea. He found that the teak deck was still intact, um, but the midsection collapsed on itself, but he, he felt, and other divers also, that it had been scavenged by the Soviets. So for a long time, the Soviets went, there's really, there's no personal belongings left. And the weirdest, um, eeriest is that there's no bones. You would think there would be a lot of remains down there. So they don't know, people don't really know what the Soviets did with this ship yeah. after the bank. And there's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of rumors. Some people thought the Amber Room was a board or advanced weapons. Um, and maybe that they just scavenged it for, you know, looting, like grave robbing. Um, you can kind of make out, um, he made a little insert, um, but he's shining a light on the ship lettering there. And that's the, the you know, final image I'll leave you. That's one of the stairwells, um, which, you know, I just try to imagine these um, people trying to make their way up onto the deck as the ship is lifting. Um, the ship sank in less than 90 minutes. Um, so, so, okay, so stopping this here, there. So, you those know, were wonderful. Look. What great pictures! And um, those are the ones that aren't in the book, correct? Right. I think there may be of the two sisters with some their cookbook. I can't remember, but um, yeah. but some of them, some of them didn't make it into the book. So it was lucky that they, they were all happy to share them. Nancy asked, happy. do you know how many survivors are alive the, to, about today? I mean, are there are, there are, there are probably less than two dozen survivors left today um, because most of them, uh, the, the ones that I interviewed were all into their, the oldest one was Ava. She's the one who lives in Switzerland and she was, um, in her late teens. So most of them, you know, were children or young teens that I was able to interview. I, I had um, the niece of a sailor, so she's not a survivor, but her, her uncle was a German sailor who was on the boat. So, you know, I was able to get letters from him and from his family. But unfortunately with the generation, uh, you know, there's just not that many. There weren't that many to begin with for the survivors. Another question is who determined who got on the boat? Was it money? Was it connections? Was it luck? What what were the circumstances that admitted them onto the, the ship? Um, short answer, all of the above. So initially oh. the way they did it, you had, um, there were some recuperating German um, Navy on the boat. And then there were also some auxiliary female Navy on the boat, about 300. They all died. They were all put into the empty swimming pool. And when the torpedo struck, they pretty much died instantly. And then the rest of them were civilian. So you had to get a boarding pass to get on the boat. Initially, it was somewhat orderly. But then what happened is people realized that preference was be giving, being given to those who had children and babies. So at one point, people started passing babies up and down the line so that you could pretend this is your baby and get on the ship. Um, but that was the, the preference given at that point to, you know, mothers with children. There were, there were uh, you know, some civilian men, but not that many, because you have to remember in the waning days of the war, um, anyone, you know, young boys were constructed, you know, forced to go fight as well as the elderly at that point as the East is the uh, Russians were coming in. Anita asked, the structure of this book is very effective. Were you influenced by any authors or books in the writing of it? Uh, so thank you for that, because the structure is something that I know I've, I've had um, also criticism for um, and, you know, well, well taken. So I wanted to structure the book where um, you start at, with people boarding the ship and then kind of zoom back out and follow the people till they're back on the ship. Um, so a bit of a, I guess, the, the creative technique that comes into the nonfiction. I didn't want to just take you chronologically through. Some people 
uh, did not like that, and that's fine. You know, this is, it doesn't work for everyone, sort of going back in time and bringing you forward. Um, not really. I think I just remember with my editor at Palgrave, we sat down and I was working on that book, and, and that was really just hashing it out. You know, what could work best? Like, how could we see this? And I think in my mind, I just kept having this image of those Soviet planes, like flying over um, from, you know, Konigsberg and Gotthaven, and like as people are trying to make their way to the port. And that's kind of, you know, I wanted to see that. Um, not really one writer influencing me for that. I think I was probably just thinking of it more visually. Um, she has another question. Do you have any private theory about what the Soviets retrieved from the wreck? Um, private, <laughs> private theory well, that'll make public. <laughs> um, I don't believe that there was anything like the Amber Room aboard. I, I do think that um, and I don't think there were secret advanced weaponry on the boat. I think that most of the art and everything that's been looted, we've seen it was, you know, put into mines and abandoned, you know, tunnels but in the waning days of the war. I do think that the Soviets wanted to cover up in part what happened. So Marinesco thought he was going to be a great hero of the Soviet Union for sinking this ship. Um, he was a a scoundrel and he was in a brothel like the night before the thinking pretty much he was a drunk um he his men loved him but his superiors you know hated him but at this point they kind of needed everyone on board so he figures i'm going to take out this ship i'm going to become a hero and that doesn't quite happen because for the soviets afterwards you know the cold war is kind of the best thing that happens to them they don't have to really at that point if they were to acknowledge what they did, they might then have to start acknowledging what they did to their own people. So uh, my, yeah, yeah. So basically, my theory is that they went, they scavenged it to take any evidence away, possibly of what they did, and really just you know, there's belongings there that people dive and took. Um, that's really, I think it's just really more basic. I don't think anything too sexy. Donna asked what you meant by Amber Room. The Amber Room was um, Catherine the Great. It was a room in one of the palaces in the Soviet Union Isn't where the, the wall, yeah, Heritage. and everything. Yeah, and in the Hermitage. And now they did a, a reproduction of it. Although some people think it's not really a reproduction and it's actually the real one and they don't want to admit that it's a reproduction. So a lot of conspiracy theories about it. And I don't think we'll ever know what the Russians. <laughs> no, <laughs> I agree. Um, Amy asks, is there any one of the characters in the book whom you identify most with? Oh, um, I think, interestingly, um, Ava a bit, which is really going to sound bizarre, because uh, she was in Hitler Youth. I definitely would not have been in Hitler Youth as, as a young Jewish woman, <laughs> but um, but she had a lot of guns. She actually got herself thrown out on purpose of Hitler Youth. Um, she ended up becoming a nurse. She ended up, um, but I identified with her. She, she just, I, I think her spirit and her streak of um, being not rebellious, but trying to buck a little bit of authority. So I really identified with that. And Irene East, um, who she was the sister with the glasses, um, just her way to just keep looking forward you know just she, she and, and ellen really wanted to talk to me because of their cousin who died and who was beloved who didn't make it the two of them survived the thinking their cousin didn't and so they wanted to bear witness for her and i could really identify with that i think just and and just the way she's just moved through life and took this as this was a part of her life but this wasn't her whole life and and that was something that you know, struck a chord for me. One of the questions I have is what, what is it about this history that you want us to come away with as an understanding at, you know, the sinking, sinking of any ship, you obviously have loss of life and the history behind it and the political intrigue that caused it. Um, what kind of um, aspect of it do you think is, is sort of like, not necessarily a central theme, but something you want us to 
to kind of walk away with? It's not I, it's I an think, awkward question, but go ahead, try it. No, no, it's not awkward because that's really, I had to think about that a lot when I was writing this. And the, the main thing for me was that, and it's going to sound very obvious that this history is not black and white. And that sounds so obvious to say, but especially I think with World War II, um, I think we're all of you know generations where it was taught in really stark terms of good versus evil, you know, black and white. And and there are obviously like undeniably easy to say evil. This is what happened. But but what the book showed me, I think, by looking at these the, you know these people who were refugees and civilians and um, what their circumstances were, you know, talking to them about what it was like growing up in their formative years with, with Nazi Germany as your, you know, and, and their parents, and is that there's just so much gray. And, and I don't think that we take enough time, um, either as educators or students of history, consumers of news, to really look at this, just how layered everything is and that it's just never as simplistic as we'd like it to be and i think that that for me was a really big takeaway um and while i was working on it you know it forced me to have to, to really look at it that way well another aspect of it that anita just brought up is i think she, what she says is i i think you did a great job showing the effects and long after effects of war which is not always present i mean if you look at like Eric Larson's Dead Wake and, and some of the other ones that deal with sinking of boats and the many Titanic books and, and the other ones that are out there, you don't often hear what happened to the people afterwards. You kind of have to follow up on that by yourself. And yours really de you know, gave us a chance to find out some of the long-term effects, particularly looking at these pictures, I find it so, I mean, your pictures are always, are, are, are so clear that the, that people wanted to tell the story but were reluctant to i mean i i just got that impression i mean it's a it, anytime you have that huge experience you want people to know about it but you don't want to necessarily tell it i i don't yeah, I think, do you know what i mean i do and i think that would maybe be my second takeaway that there's a you know a certain agony in surviving and um that they they are i think they felt incumbent upon them to share their story um so because of those who died who were with them on the ship or for helga for i think it was more than 10 years they didn't know where her father was because he had been then taken by the soviets so and that legacy of trauma that you know you could see then in their children and in their grandchildren that i think and the silence that they felt they, Ellen told me the story of how they, when they first got to Ontario after the war, I'm sorry, not, when she was older, she was working. So, you know, they'd been there now maybe 15, 20 years and she was at work and, and she remembers some colleagues saying to her, oh, world, you know, it was really hard during the war. You know, we had a ration or butter or a margarine and she never said, what happened to her because of that fear of being judged because she was from Eastern Prussia because people would look at her and say the enemy. And so I think that, I guess that's my third takeaway that we don't know people's stories just by looking at them. You know, everyone has a, has a story um, and it's so easy to just, you know, make judgments and assume um, that, we, that we know who people are. One other question I have is, um... What do you read for pleasure and what are you reading now? So um, I own a so bookstore, you know, I got to ask. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that question. So I just finished um, Gregory Maguire's A Wild Winter Swan for fiction. And I'm going to start tonight, Interior, China, um, Interior Chinatown. And then for my nonfiction read right now is Thomas Rex's First Principles, which is... Um, that one, the last the, one skipped. I didn't hear what the title was. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Rex, his book called First Principles, which is about right. what the founding, yeah, the four, um, it's Adams, Jefferson, Washington, and um, why am I, and Madison, mm -hmm. who, you know, their education and what, what Greeks and Roman philosophy informed them. So that's, those are my fun reads. 
Did, was there another book? Did you no? Was there a for work read or no? Was there a what? Oh, no, I didn't know if there was another. Yeah, those are the two books. Well, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about the founding, uh, you know, the founders, the, um, you know, when you mentioned them, I all I, I sat there and Hamilton just flew through my head because everyone now is very aware of the beginning of our country because of that musical. And there are people that never would have been exposed to history and never read that book you're talking about or this book you're talking about. There's more nonfiction being sold now than has been sold in a very, very long time because usually fiction has dominated the book market. So that's where I saw the niche with this particular book in that people are hungry to hear about our past and other people's past and how, it, how it's relatable. Um, the other thing that I have discovered as a bookseller is that for some reason that is inexplicable to me, there's a huge influx of readers reading World War II stories. And I think one of the reasons that they read World War II stories is my personal sense is that people have lived through the worst and come out the other end. And some actually many remain hopeful. And so it's a, it's a tale that is relatable right now. I mean, Winston Churchill's Splendid in the Vile, people are reading over and over again. Eric Larson's, um, you know, and anything he writes basically. Yeah. But it's because of, you know, his writing, but a lot of nonfiction, particularly this kind of theme of a terrible disaster. This one was caused on purpose, others weren't and that people come out and they kind of are very sober about it, but they also learn a great deal about it. And I just, I, I got a lot out of it. And I think that reading the comments here, looking at Anita, I think you did a great job of showing the effects of long effects, long after effects of war. Um, Anita was saying my heritage is all German. So it was very enlightening to read for her. Um, yeah. and, and did I hear Rich start up? No, it was me. I was thinking too that now people are ready. Time has come. People are ready. You know, when we were kids, the Germans were the bad guys, period. You didn't, you didn't care or worry about what the Germans, what happened to the Germans. If, you know, you, when you played army, you had, you know, the Germans and the Americans. The Germans were the bad guys. I think the farther away we get from that, the more people just begin to see war as war and uh, how everyone is affected. I'm thinking of something like, um, like all the light we cannot see, where there's a character who's a German boy who's in the army. And that is um, historical fiction. Uh, yes, it was. No, just, I'm fiction. just as a, as a. But I'm just using that as an example. People are willing to to look at the other side as humans a little more than as bad guys. Yeah, I think um, you know what came to mind too. I think was um, preceded my book was Letters from Iwo Jima. That oh yeah, a great book. And and I think that did a really good job because I, my impression has also been, you know, Japan was bad, you know, and every, but everyone was so willing to, you know, take up arms for the emperor and in and, and that book and then subsequent books after that, you realize that that's not what it was. You know, you, you had, this is a little bit more complex than that. And I, I did think that that was a really, um, Good book, and there's some really good literature now coming out from, I think, a generation of Vietnamese writers now who are starting to show um, the Vietnam War through the eyes of Vietnamese, you know, because they're Vietnamese writers telling the story, not Americans. So it's not American centric, and I think that's in the, just another way to. Well, look really at George Takei's work. As well. I mean, George Takei came out with a graphic novel for adults and for children that deals with his life as a refugee at a refugee camp. In the US. In the US. 
Um, I can remember, I am the child of World War II veterans. I mean, I'm older, so I, and I was a, the youngest of my, my siblings. And um, I can remember having a babysitter as a child and she was a German lady and something came on the TV and I said, and I was very little, and I said, oh, dirty Germans, you know, they're so nasty, they're so awful. And she said, some of us didn't like Hitler. And she was trying to explain to a little child that there was a German resistance and that there were people that were fighting against the Third Reich within her own country. And that that's how she ended, I mean, she escaped to the US to get away from it. But I, every time I hear about that dynamic within the country also, it's an interesting history because, mm -hmm. you know, who knows where our country's headed. Because my heritage was German, it was more, we always more thought about the Nazis were bad, not, you know, like my mother's parents came over from Germany when they were young and before World War I. And their part of Germany, which was up, up in the north near Denmark, the flatlands there, that, I always felt like the war didn't touch them all that much. You know, yes, there were young men who went off to, went to war during the World War II. I felt like their lives kind of stayed the same the whole time. That's just how it seemed to me from what I heard, you know, from my grandparents and their relatives. Mm. But, you know, there was always that distinction. It's not, you know, not the Germans, but the Nazis who were, you know, who were bad. Although my father thought all the Germans were, you know, responsible, <laughs> even though he was of German heritage. Well, it's interesting to think about this. I mean, it's, it's, and I think you're right, Catherine, you raise a really good point about we're so used to thinking of it in terms of the horrors of the Holocaust and how awful and how, how <clears throat> awfully that people would treat other people and how that so easily happened and all of the, the dynamics of thinking about that uh, affect our lives. But this is now, I mean, you telling this history, I never even knew about this. I mean, yeah. I never would have thought about it. I mean, I feel like I stumbled on a big piece of history that, that not a lot of people had heard of. Um, and when I read some of the reviews, they talked about it as, um, you know, they obviously compared it to the Titanic, which is wildly famous, but that this was a big, much bigger deal. Mm. And I, you know, is it because of the lack of communication availability then? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think, I think yeah, oh. I think this, is, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say the suppression, I mean, you know, or, or the reason we didn't hear about it all, I think has to do with the Cold War because, you know, this oh. war to end, we're immediately into the Cold War. The United States wants the Soviet Union. You know, initially we think we're going to be allies. Now we're not allies. So we have reasons to kind of suppress it and move on. The Germans definitely don't want to talk about it because if we talk about, you know, if the government talks about our poor civilians, people are going to say, really? Your poor civilians? You know, look what you did. And then, and then the Soviet Union. So there's a little bit of in self-interest from the part of, I think, the government to, you know, to not really talk about it. And then as an event, you know, upwards of 10,000 people is shocking. And um, then I think it should be shocking because in the past three days, we've had almost that number of people here die of COVID, but um, I digress. <laughs> um, but 10,000 people in, in World War II is nothing in, a, in, in terms of just numbers, right? So. That's another thing that people just, their heads explode with how many numbers, you know, 20 million selling cells or how many in Hiroshima. And, and so I think that's also, um, you know, it's hard for, you know, so a story like this can get buried really easily or, or forgotten. And then the Eastern Front, I think it wasn't until um, Thomas Snyder's um, Bloodlands, which was a really good source um, initially when I started just to do my reading, like my prep work to figure this out, um, which really talked about the Eastern Front in a way that I think hadn't, I think that was really one of the first books um, in Max Hastings' book, Armageddon, um, really deal with the Eastern Front 
in a way that I don't, you know, most of us probably didn't get too much of in school. And that I think is another reason we're not so familiar with the Goose Club. Mary, Marietta just brought up a really interesting point too, is there's a memoir out now by a Japanese man who was a kamikaze pilot who obviously survived. I've only read about the memoir, but it seems quite a different take on what we imagine of Japanese soldiers. And so I find myself completely forgetting that there was a mother war going on at the same time mm. with its own dynamic and its own different flavor of politics. And it's just, but it had the same, the same level of horror, not to yeah. the degree that the, that the West did. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> Catherine, I can't thank you enough for, for this <laughs> opportunity to get together to see all of you without a mask on, which was lovely. <laughs> um, you know, to really visit, to talk, to gather. Um, I'm looking forward to having you back. Maybe we can discuss your next book, which I love, um, Queen of the Mountaineers, The Trailblazing Life of Fanny Bullock Workman. So let's, let's make a tentative um, commitment to have you for our history book group for that one, especially if we can gather together and raise a glass to good old Fanny, you know? Yes. So it'd be really fun to do. I mean, whatever you're coming out with, I'd like to stay connected. Um, oh, I love, thank you. Would be great. And this has been recorded. So I'll put it up on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. But when I thank all of you for registering, I'll send you the link. It just takes me a day or so to get my act together. But I just, I really had a good time and your pictures were wonderful. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. It was really nice. Thank you, everyone. And Thanks, happy Hanukkah. Catherine. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. Thank Thanks, you guys. Thanks Thank for you. hosting too, man. Thank you. How lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was so fun. I'm so, I'm so happy that, you know, we can still do these. Yeah, it really does make a difference because I think that, that a lot of people are lonely for human touch, but they're also lonely for seeing a face Yeah, and having a discussion. And this group tends to be really interested in what's going on. And I, I adore them for it. You know, oh, so. it was really lovely. It was great. Thank you so much. I had a Thank great you time. so much. And let's do it again. All right. All right. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.